welcome to our um, lunchtime session today for the British Computer Society's Service Management and ITAM 2020 conference. Um, it's the title we have this year is the Digital Workplace Revolution, and we're obviously trying to draw out the discussion around everything that's been impacted and changed throughout this year to the way we're working and how that's accelerated the digital um, workplace revolution. So lots of our conversation will be pulled together this evening through the panel discussion and most of our presenters are coming back for that session this evening. Um, so we will be able to ask more questions for those that you didn't already have questions asked to and also should something have come up since you've seen the presentations that's prompted you to want to ask a, an, another question or even just to contribute to the conversation about what's been changing and impacting in your workplace. Um, just to, for me, I'm Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Burt, I'm the chair of this group, uh, sorry, the vice chair of this group, <laughs> sorry, our chairman Richard will be hosting the session this evening, uh, the panel session. Um, and so just want to tell you a little bit about the BCS and our group. So we're a volunteer group at the BCS and we host the service management and ITAM group, which is including asset management. So it, can, it covers all of configuration, asset management, release management, and lots of those ITIL processes rolled together. So we actually have quite a broad area, which is why our conference spans quite a number of those um, threads as well. Um, we're a volunteer group. I'm not sure whether I mentioned that, but we do organise monthly events where we have um, networking opportunities for people and professional development where we usually have some great speakers coming in talking about our favourite topics like licensing specifically around Oracle and SAP or Microsoft like the real enterprise type um, products and um, we'll have all sorts of other topics so do follow us throughout the year if you do want to follow us you can follow us on LinkedIn um, if you go to the conference web page on the about page, there is our LinkedIn link that you can click on to join the specialist group. There is also a um, button at the bottom which tells is a link to join our or take you through to our web page at the BCS, and that is our main web page and that hosts all of our contact details as well. Um, so there's also an email address that you can contact us if you would like to join or be a presenter at one of our events. And that email address is sm-itam at bcs.org. Um, that'll be posted in the chat. Kylie will be posting a few of the links that we've just covered in the chat in case you want to download them today and haven't captured them throughout these presentations. Just want to also let you know that we've got we're we're posting on or we're tweeting about the event as we've been going through. And so if you'd like to tweet, do use our hashtag that's going to be put in the chat, but it's hashtag S M I T A M C O N F 2020. So it's S M I T M Conf 2020. Um, hopefully you've seen the keynote presentation that was pre-recorded and pre-released last Thursday. Claire will be back with us in the session this evening, you know, to tie all this together and answer any additional questions. That if you'd like to see the keynote and you haven't done so, you can find that link from the conference web page and has also been posted on LinkedIn, um, the the YouTube link for where that's where that's available to watch. All of these sessions are being recorded so we will have them but we won't be having them available to you for about three weeks once it's gone through the editing process at the BCS headquarters. Uh, I've got no more real sessions to introduce to you because I've already talked about the panel and wrap-up session that we're having with everyone this evening and um, that will be our final session but for now just a few things about today. There's a question box that you can type questions in and we'd love you to type in questions and make it a little bit interactive with Oliver today as he goes through his presentation. Do type comments or um, any questions in that question box and we'll have breaks throughout his presentation where I'll be able to ask him those questions on your behalf and he'll answer them for you. Um, and then just finally to say, we welcoming Oliver here right now for this presentation and um, he's going to talk to us the evolution of business and new, uh, business as usual. So thank you for joining us today, Oliver, and over to you. Thanks, Marilyn. It's great to be here. And it's, it's interesting, I was just reflecting on the fact that the last time I gave a, a talk for BCS, uh, for your previous kind of incarnation of, of Specialist Group, it was in person. So it's, it's nice now to be, to be doing this uh, virtually as part of your conference. So thanks very much for the invite. And 
yeah, as I say, this, this talk is about the evolution of business as usual uh, and a bit about an initiative that I'm running called Architect Tomorrow. So it provides more of an architecture, I suppose, perspective on, on some of this. And I know Richard, the chair of, of, of the group, is also from an architecture background. So, you know, it, it kind of provides a, a different sort of perspective on, on some of this kind of conversation. So before we get into that, who, who, who am I? Uh, I'm actually, I've been part of BCS since uh, pre-2012. So I've been part of BCS for some time. I decided to become a chartered professional. Um, actually, sorry, apologies. I've been part of BCS for longer than that. I became a chartered professional in 2012 um, and I have been ever since. And so I've kind of kept a keen interest in BCS, got involved in some of the specialist groups, the Enterprise Architecture one and um, security ones, risk ones, and also this one on IT asset management uh, and software asset management. And to my background, just quickly, who am I? So my, my background is as a, a developer, actually DevOps sort of leader, enterprise architect and solution architect, and then have become a, a chief architect uh, advising CTOs and CIOs um, on, on architecture, uh, everything from cloud to you know, emerging technologies uh, and so on and so forth. And so um, my, my, my current role is in a company called Tanium, and I'll talk a, a little bit about those guys, although I'm, I'm, this is very much not a sales pitch at all. I'm, I'm just kind of coming to talk to you about some things that I find interesting. It's not an official kind of talk uh, on behalf of my company. And prior to Tanium, I was at Deloitte for three years, leading the, the risk advisory um, area from an architecture perspective, so the chief architect for, for Deloitte Risk Advisory. And uh, I'm the community lead for Architect Tomorrow, which I'll touch on a little bit in a bit. Um, you can find me on, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter uh, as well. And so here's a picture of me back when you could actually get a haircut. Um, I'm still not going to the hairdresser, so uh, apologies for those of you looking at my, my rather... Um, Disheveled hair at the moment, it's, uh, it is what it is, it's not a priority. So um, anyway, uh, enough about me. Let's talk about this, this talk. So the evolution of business as usual. You know, there's some statements here that I, that I heard, I've heard you know, during the current crisis, current pandemic, which I thought were really sort of interesting and kind of gave a, gave a good reflection across three different perspectives of where we've got to. So there's various different you know, versions of this, but you know, two to three work, years worth of technology adoption in two to three weeks or two to three months, whatever, you know, whatever time frame different organizations have kind of gone through with their sudden change with tech adoption. Uh, so that technology change is, has been massive and it's, you know, I'll come on in a minute to talk about where you draw the line between technology serving the business and the business being technology. And that's an interesting kind of, um, you know, change that we've perhaps seen now. And then another piece around kind of culture and how people are working, ways of working. You know, why didn't we realize we could work like this before? You know, why has it taken uh, a, a, a crisis to push us into working more effectively, working with perhaps more empathy and allowing folks to, to, to um, handle other aspects of their lives rather than just their working life by, by, by being able to work more flexibly and being able to work from, from a different location. You know, for, for most who can, you know, that tends to be working from home. And that, that obviously has benefits, but it has, has drawbacks. And that kind of feeds into the last point here, really, around sort of personal life and, and, and time. And, you know, the, the, this is actually a quote from my neighbour who, who said, you know, I, I don't miss and I'm not definitely not going back to my two hour each way commute. And by that, she means, you know, she won't be doing it every day. She was doing it every day. She'll maybe do it now once, once or twice a week now, once, once things sort of settle down. She's, she's still not, you know, gone back to the office. Uh, I just think it's a really interesting kind of, you know, uh, benefit, I suppose, that, that some people are able to... Um, able to get from, from the situation we're in. So, so yeah, it's kind of three sort of sort of perspectives, I suppose, on what, what we're all going through. Yes, it's difficult. It's, it's you know, for, for many, um, you know, and I don't want to kind of make light of, uh, of this. You know, I've, uh, I, I've had sort of um, issues in, in my family and friends and colleagues with, with this. So I'm definitely not making light of it, but I just, with, with this talk, which I've given before, um, just for some different perspectives, I suppose, on, what business as usual now means and how that's evolved, not just about the pandemic, but how, how have we kind of got here and how have we kind of led up to this moment of, uh, that we're kind of now, now in and how do we look for opportunities to thrive in this uh, time rather than just react uh, and survive. And so before we kind of zone in more on um, you know, the current times, I wanted to just talk about actually how, how have we got here because I think it's yeah, I've done a fair amount of reading around anthropology and you know, kind of culture and, and psychology, and I think it's really interesting to kind of look back at where we've come from as a as a as a society and as a species more broadly to kind of 
just sort of shift our perspective a little bit on where, where we are. Because I think sometimes it's very easy to get caught up in the moment and not reflect back on how do we actually get here? So this slide, uh, I've got a few builds. We're just going to just sort of talk to, you know, wh where we started as, as, as human beings, as society, and kind of the trends and the tools and so on that, that, that we've adopted along the way. So we're going to start with, you know, the era of, uh, 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 early society, early civilization, where people started to kind of pick up tools and started to kind of, you know, um, do do more things with with, with uh, as, a, as a society, as a community, rather than individually becoming less animal-like and you know, forming tribes, forming farms, forming kind of factions, and then ultimately kind of moving into the the world that we find ourselves in now, where it's almost unrecognizable that we kind of came from the animal kingdom almost. And so if, if we kind of just quickly kind of uh, look at this, kind of we move from this hunter-gatherer kind of you know, existence, uh, we then, you know, through, through picking up knowledge and, and tools, um, we, we then kind of form tribes and farms and so on. And, and along the way, each time there's been a, a tool and there's been uh, time saved, a time saving from a tool, which has allowed us to do different things. So if you look at the kind of hunter-gatherer into the sort of tribes and farming kind of era, you know, picking up. Uh, tools uh, and, and farming techniques allowed us to free up time to expand knowledge and, and, and other um, activities. If you then think about um, you know, the next big shift, you could argue is perhaps then through the industrial areas, obviously I'm massively simplifying <laughs> human history here, but the shift into you know, more industrial era, you know, um, factories, creating processes that, that we needed to kind of follow for efficiency and getting every, all the workers to go to those factories in order to get that efficiency, which kind of follows on from the farming you know, aspect where we started to kind of take more control over where, where we worked rather than chasing after our food. So then, you know, kind of moving into factories was, you know, how we produce things and how we kind of collaborated was in those locations. And then what's interesting is when we shifted to the sort of office, you know, the knowledge um, the based economy and the information age, which obviously is relatively recent compared to the other um, transitions, we still um, held on to the kind of office as a, as a place to go to do work, much like it was a factory. And there's some really interesting um, books and, and, and talks. There, there's a chap um, called Dave Coplin, who is well worth checking out. He talks about the rise of the humans more recently, but he also talks about um, you know, how, how offices really aren't designed for, for, for information work. They're really kind of a throwback and a legacy to, to past ways of working in factories. And initially, of course, the office, you needed to go there because that's where all the paper files were. It's where all the legacy technology was. You know, back in the day, of course, uh, the computer used to be a you know, massive room. You know, used to have mainframes and perhaps you know, terminals where you had to go and physically go and use the machine. So, you know, if we kind of fast forward to today and the internet and the decentralizing force of the internet and um, you know, technology has kind of moved on, has, has, has um, shrunk in size, uh, and the advent of, of mobile devices allowed us to have far more flexibility about where, where we work. And so, yeah, let's quickly add these builds here. So you know, these technologies that have allowed us to, to do that, I've sort of touched on the, the earlier ones. So yeah, the, the, the big shift really was the kind of personal computer and the local area network. You know, the office then started to become, you know, more like the, the modern office that we recognize now. And then the next big shift was, was, was the internet and distributed computing, which allowed for a distributed workforce. Whilst it allowed for it, most organizations weren't really taking advantage of that fact. And they were still trapped in a factory-like way of working where everyone went to the office you know, from a set time period and that's how they got things done. So I think you know, with, with moves to um, you know, organize, organize work differently through things like open source movements, uh, you know, open source software, how you can kind of create massive projects uh, and essentially you're a virtual organization. There's no physical office, you know, things like Linux and, uh, and other open source projects don't have, you know, a physical office where those things get built. They're built, you know, in a distributed manner with folks working from their offices or, or from home. So it's some of these trends you know, that have come about as, as a result of the internet, plus things like smartphones and tablets uh, and the ability to kind of be more agile and, and be more self-organizing as teams are almost ironically pointing towards us moving towards a tribal and, and perhaps a more localized community-based approach to work and, and how we kind of organize ourselves. So I quite ironically, and if you look at these lines of productivity, you know, again, vastly oversimplified, you know, arguably there was an increase in productivity as we industrialized and as we kind of you know created processes and create efficiency. 
but the agility reduced quite you know quite significantly you know with a farm all of a sudden you can't move that farm that farm is rooted to to you know, obviously rooted to that area with a factory you know you you've, you've got even more there because if you want to make that factory do something new you've got to retool it you know if you need to expand it it means building building more buildings and so on it's 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 not agile really at all but potentially the future with the distributed workforce really leveraging the power of the the modern internet and and you know techniques like you know, open source uh, movement have shown you have made possible ironically we maybe have more of a return perhaps to tribes and communities and in fact in software companies for quite a while now you have this concept of you know squads and tribes um, and, and kind of community kind of missions and so yeah so to, to my last build is just to suggest that, that perhaps we're going kind of going back in, in our thinking and and actually in a way perhaps as humans that's how we like to work and perhaps even though the current pandemic is forcing us to work in a certain way where we're perhaps more local and we're working um, more, in a more distributed manner, perhaps that's actually, you know, from a psychological standpoint, perhaps how we prefer to work. We prefer to work more locally uh, with a, you know, in a specialist team, getting things done than actually going to a big massive office, um, you know, where, where perhaps you don't feel as, as, as safe right now uh, with everything that's kind of going on. Um, but if you if you look to some of the material that I referenced just now, the kind of Dave Copland series, he talks about you know the modern open plan office being a bit like the savanna, African savanna. So you feel you know some people, particularly knowledge workers who just want to kind of get stuff done, find the modern open plan office actually a really really difficult environment to be productive. So really interesting um, you know, parallels between uh, you know, offices, uh, perhaps not not being the ideal place for getting knowledge work done. For building things, of course, you know, factories, production lines and so on make a lot of sense. But trying to apply the same processes and the same operating model to knowledge work and in the information age, you know, it, it, it has, you know, has some challenges that I think you know, are worth exploring. And so they're kind of a bit of a joke, you know, where, where will we lead? Will we lead to this kind of augmented human that a lot of people are talking about? Um, you know, um, if, if, you, if you believe... Um, Ray Kurzweil, you know, perhaps you, you, you subscribe to that. I put it on here as a little bit of a joke, but in a way, it kind of where will technology go in the future? Where, you know, will we be augmented with more um, smart assistants and so on? Um, you know, I prefer the term intelligent augmentation to AI, but you know, clearly this trend is 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 um, is only continuing. And let's let's kind of look at the other context that most organisations are operating in. Um, so you know, move, moving beyond. In fact, sorry, before I do that, Marilyn, is it is it is there any are there any questions on on this kind of shift? Because I appreciate this. There's a lot of material here, and there may well be questions here. Yeah, we um, got a comment from David here saying, surely the distributed workforce is more productive if you own a big house with a space for a home office, and somewhat less so if you're in a bed set with children. There's a huge display of digital um, deprived underclass. That that is a that is a really really good point actually, and it's very easy for someone who has a spare room with a with, with an office in to kind of forget that it's not the most productive um, for everyone. I guess the the difference is though it doesn't it, it allows flexibility. I would say it, it allows you you know when when things are perhaps more back to normal, it will allow you to kind of work from where you think your is is most suitable. So that could be a co working space. Which is down the road, rather than going, you know, two hours on the train or you know an hour on the train to to a big office that you don't really need to be in, because actually the local office with your you know immediate team perhaps is the more productive place to be. Um, but no, I completely accept that for some folks, and in fact for me at times with kids at home and so on, um, it's not always been the most productive. I guess my, so. Maybe productivity is a bit of a question mark. Maybe assuming it goes up is um, a little bit. Um, naive, maybe it maybe it varies, but I would say I was speaking with someone uh, from a former employer who's a, a large bank, and they said their contact centre. They did you know they did some 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 surveys and they also looked at the data, and, and the resounding result of allowing their contact centre team to work from home was that they they were more productive. They said they were more productive, they were happier, uh, and not only were they saying that, the the data supported that. They were getting more calls completed, you know, more successful customer uh, resolution of customer issues and so on so yeah no it's it's a tricky one it's there's obviously no one size fits all for this but i think it's the agility and the flexibility i would say that allow folks to choose where is uh, the most productive location for them to be 
Now, I accept that this will be better when we're in a situation where we are in lockdowns and, you know, um, what, what, what I'm hoping is folks will have learned through going through this process of, uh, of having to work differently. They will understand there are different operating models now than getting everyone together in a huge, great big office. Um, so, so, yeah, but no, so really great point. Um, but but I, but I think my, my point here is it's more about flexibility and adaptability than just working from home. And that's definitely one of the themes that we want to draw through this evening and this whole conference and obviously work out how we can make sure that we do get these benefits that we are getting, like reducing our travel time and all those things that are wasting time for us, mm -hmm. you know, maintained and like what can we do to um to ensure that we do get those. And, and and just to add to that, I was thinking about like the lots of the places where I've worked as a consultant. Um, I've been in offices working in global teams mostly, and nobody in the office I'm sat beside is often the person that I'm working with. And everybody in the office is on a phone call, on a conference call. So I'm yeah. often not interacting with people. And there is like, you're absolutely right. In an open plan office, there is so much noise because the whole floor is having a conversation at the same time. This you is know, quite ironic, isn't it, really, that everyone comes to that yeah. one place. Um, I think where it makes sense still is absolutely where you want to collaborate, where you want to work together, kind of to share, you know, ideas and work through something. But you're right. I mean, I, I, I'm the same in the large organisation. I think this is worse in the bigger organisations where you kind of have hot desking and you're sat next to someone that perhaps you're not working with. And you're right, you're on you're on a video call or something to, you know, a, a, another team somewhere in the country. So it's, yeah, it, it, again, I guess it, it, it does it does vary, but I would say, yeah, if you can get this right, there are benefits to be had here. Yeah. Do we have any others or shall I, shall I move on? We do. Um, I'll, I'll just give yeah. you these next couple as well if we've got yeah. time. Uh, this yeah. one is um, yeah. from David Torrance. He's asking, is there any evidence that productivity and agility increase with a distributed workforce? So I, I obviously just cited the example of the financial services firm, but I guess it's, you know, and, and I don't have their data. I just have I have that on an anecdotal basis from someone who who works there. But I'm sure there will be you know various studies and, and so on published by the big consultancies um, on this one. So I think kind of look out for for, for those from the likes of McKinsey and Deloitte and so on. Um, I I I, anecdotal, I I think I've gone through waves with this one. I think initially I felt far more productive because I wasn't distracted as much uh, and I was able just to get stuff done. And then. I think a couple of months ago, I got to a point where actually I was feeling quite lonely. I was lacking connection uh, and I felt like I needed to have more informal kind of conversations with colleagues, uh, which I was getting from going to the office. I used to go to the office about maybe once or twice a week. Um, and then I would go to different places, you know, go and see customers and so on throughout, throughout the rest of the week. And I was just sort of feeling like I was missing that connection with my colleagues and, and with customers and so on. So I think it's I think this has gone through waves for me personally. I could obviously only speak speak speaking about myself here. Um, but actually other people I've spoken to about this as well have said the same. They said initially that they felt they increased their productivity, but then they realized they couldn't just carry on working like that. It's just impossible to kind of be on, you know, 100 percent all the time on Zoom calls. It's quite exhausting. I'm sure many people will, you know, kind of recognize that as well, that to operate on a Zoom call is far more kind of uh, emotionally, um, uh, you know, what's the word, kind of exhausting because you're having to try and work out what the kind of, you know, non-verbal cues are and what's going on at the other end of the camera, which is, you know, and, and I was actually, I was joking earlier as before we set up this call, that you can't see a lot of my expression here because I'm quite an expressive person. I use my hands a lot, but actually you're largely just seeing my, my face and there's a lot of non-verbal communication and having to sort of read between the lines a lot more is quite exhausting emotionally. So, um, I, I think it's I, I, this simplistic kind of graph I've shown here is very much you know uh, what I think the future could hold if we get this right, Marilyn. To your point about we want to navigate this the right way, but mm -hmm. I think individually uh, everyone will be you know somewhere different perhaps on on these two lines. Yeah, cool. Another in on the same thread. This has obviously generated a bit of conversation with people <laughs> from. Kieran here, and Kieran says, uh, can we assume that the distributed workforce model will continue in the future to be adapted in many IT industries? He says, I believe the pandemic situation has really taught us that this model works in reality. I think for IT and software, absolutely. My, my view is this, this has demonstrated that this works. Uh, I think for other industry sectors, it's more challenging, of course. And, and I, I almost could draw another picture here that shows 
you know, how physical, uh, how much does the organization operate in the physical world? And by that, I mean, how much does it produce things or provide in-person services, perhaps like retail, um, you know, or experiences, hospitality? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, because, in fact, we did it as part of Architect Tomorrow, I'll come on to it in a moment. Um, we did a panel where we talked about, you know, the different reactions that different industries will have. So, so in answer to the original question, yes, I think this has shown IT departments and technology firms that, of course, with the internet and distributed computing, your workforce can also be distributed. Uh, and I think most organisations in tech get the fact you can leverage tech to work in this way. I think there are other sectors that are perhaps older and steeped in more tradition and more history, perhaps where there are there is more of an attachment to being in a in, a, in an environment in a, in a particular location, or there is a need to build things physically where this model won't apply. But I think for IT departments, uh, and, you know, and um, the knowledge worker, in most cases, I would I would see this being a wake up call to say, to my point earlier, why why didn't we realise we could work this way? It you know it, it works much better for people personally. And it can work when it's done right, much better for people from a business productivity standpoint as well. I certainly observed that it's come down to trust in organisations before. I've worked in departments where they've originally virtualised offices in the in the yep. early stages of virtual environments. And, you know, the IT professionals would have been more productive should they been allowed to work from home, but the management wouldn't allow them. It was just ridiculous. It was just, you would save on um, sick days, you know, people would just have hospital appointments from home and just take a couple of hours here and there and fill in that time rather than, you know, being out of the work for the whole day, which is counterintuitive. Yeah, I'll let you carry on and we'll keep some more questions. Yeah, let's, let's move on because there's a danger we get stuck here. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it's one that's full of discussion. It's great. But <laughs> yeah. let's shift into more of the, the pain points that perhaps a modern, you know, modern enterprise um, uh, or a, a operations team, technology team, you know, are facing at the moment. And this is what I see, by the way, from working with my customers and prospects, it, it, are, the, are these challenges, you know, in, in 2020. So, you know, uh, clearly cybersecurity uh, is, is still a, a, a big issue, uh, particularly with, ever, with a lot of people now shifting to this distributed working model. You know, the front line has now moved to people's individual PCs. It's no longer kind of the enterprise firewall, perhaps, or, or the enterprise system. It's now everyone's machine. So, you know, the security breach cost and challenge is, is, is not going anywhere. And that's tied in sort of compliance challenges as well, particularly if you're in a heavily regulated industry. So there's a security and compliance challenge here sort of on the left. The other thing that's a big challenge as well is we just have so many different tools. We've got like over 40 in average. We did a survey um, earlier in the year and it showed that, that the average is 43 for the number of, of, of systems and applications that are there to manage operations and security, which, you know, it speaks to, I think, you know, something where problems have, have, have kind of popped up and people have thrown money at them to make them go away. So point solutions have been purchased to solve sort of individual pain points, which is, uh, you know, not sustainable and very expensive. And then on the right hand side, you have the the pressures of, for operations to continue to operate, to do more with less in many cases. That's often a, a mantra I hear about the operations unit. You know, but but in a in a world where the digital landscape is only getting more complex, there are more processes going digital, you know, more things going online, more apps being built, you know, more efficient online processes, you know, different ways of engaging with different teams and so on. So there are, you know, there's 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 a pressure to kind of reduce costs. At the same time as uh, uh, you know, a wave of, of new projects and new initiatives to do more, uh, and so how do you get more efficient to kind of face into that challenge? Uh, and the time to market pressures as well. You know, trying to get stuff. Done. I mean, a great example here is where you know the, the current crisis forced many organisations to offer a digital channel, and it's been really interesting to see everyone from small, you know, um, little takeaways or restaurants are attending to takeaways through to large organisations having to pivot. A lot of the stuff that they were doing in person to you know a, a new um, online experience and the pressure to get that to market fast and do it well and execute it effectively you know is another pressure that, that the IT and operations teams and security teams are kind of facing into is how do we how do we make all this stuff easy and we're not seen as the the team of saying no and the team of slowing things down you know but we're the ones that are kind of driving productivity so we we see the, the productivity killers here being um, the, the number of tools that, that folks have creates confusion. There's a bunch of out-of-date information, and 
slow response. You know, if you have all these different systems giving you a, a picture of your current digital landscape, it's no wonder then it's it's hard to then understand what new changes or or, or what kind of responses to cha day to day challenges are going to going to bring. And of course, that's before we add in the distributed workforce challenge. So now the IT teams are, are you know. Perhaps most are now out of the initial perhaps emergency response to the, the work from home shift. Uh, although I'd say it's coming in waves uh, as, as the kind of you know, um, government response to this in different locations changes. But I think now the, you know, the, the shift has perhaps gone from the immediate kind of ship out laptops or, or sort out webcams or whatever the immediate kind of problem perhaps was to solve. So now how do we do this on a sustained basis? How do we make sure we can see and manage and operate and secure our IT environments, regardless of whether someone's working from home, working in a cafe, you know, working in the office, or has a cloud, um, you know, platform that they're using. How do we get visibility and control and management of all of that so that we keep stay compliant, uh, we you know minimise security uh, issues, but our costs uh, are, kept, are kept to a minimum, and we're able to kind of respond to, to challenges. I guess, Marin, this is probably another good one to kind of see if any anyone thinks I've missed a big um, sort of challenge perhaps a big arrow that they think is missing or whether they agree with with these sort of challenges in 2020 are these the big sort of ticket items that are causing pain for them wow we've got quite a lot of stuff still coming in for the last stuff more than <laughs> <laughs> um i had a comment from kylie just saying that you know an insurance company that she's worked in um the they used a way of addressing issues with employees around working from home kind of thing. It was a competition in call centre. I'm not exactly certain what she means by that, whether competition is the right word. It was it, Sorry, let me just read it and see if it makes sense to you. Yeah. I yeah. used to work for an insurance company which experiences, which experiences high levels of competition for call centre workers and we're finding work from home was one of the ways of addressing this issue. Okay, so I, I read that to be, I mean, uh, um, perhaps Carly, you can give us another response to Carol, but I see that as being competition to get um, workers through the door because it's a competitive environment to get you know, tr skilled um, customer oh, yeah. service representatives and That's therefore right. offering work from home as a, uh, a way of attracting talent. Um, exactly. Is, 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 is one way of dealing with that. And so yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, yeah, that's another, I guess that's more of a comment on the previous one, but it ties in with the distributed workforce point here. Yeah. Um, and, it's, yeah. and that was pre-pandemic, so it, it's an example, I guess, of how the pandemic has really sped up a change that was happening really quite slowly over a period of time. Yeah, it's like the, the first point I made, I think, is that, that folks have seen um, you know, destruction on a scale that, that would have taken years, but it's happened in weeks or months. So no, absolutely, it's kind of accelerated business change as much as I think it's accelerated technology adoption, and that's, yeah, that's a great example. Marion, were there any questions on um, this slide? No, nothing. Okay. No comment. <laughs> uh, I do. Yeah. I do. I'm just. I was just typing it out. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, sure. Kylie. Just ask it. Um, yeah. Well, it's not. A, it's a comment, really. Yeah. For me, and it's really topical, which is probably why it's at the top of my head. Uh, many of these things are looking forwards, Oliver. You know, particularly transformation, increasing complexity of digital landscape, etc. But actually, you know, we saw over the weekend just the mess that can be created by using legacy systems yep. um, and, and you know legacy file formats that are so deeply embedded within the way organizations work that it is prohibitively expensive and risky to upgrade them and I was listening to a webinar a couple of weeks ago uh, which was all about you know are we reaching the point of where it's becoming impossible to maintain some of these old systems where yep. where the car crash of legacy systems with digitalization is actually going to to mean that you know really critical things start failing and it starts impacting us on our day-to-day -day level yeah no absolutely kind of i guess that's implied by that operations arrow really is that the, <laughs> the landscape isn't just the digital landscape it's also the legacy landscape right and mm -hmm. um and no and, I, and we see this with with cost as well this challenge of how do we continue to compete with the really nimble, agile digital startups? So if you look at the banks, a lot of them are having to sort of compete with the, the Monzos and the Starling banks and so on of this world who are able just to, you know, roll out releases and new iterations of their app, you know, in, in, in minutes, not the weeks and months that it takes perhaps a, a very large established bank with legacy platforms that need to be changed or, or adapted. So, so now I, I think this is a bit of a perfect storm in many cases for most organizations that they have all these pressures to change to stay compliant, but also 
they've got these sort of fixed parts of their foundations, as it were, that are very hard to change, very risky to change. Um, and actually, a lot of folks have a, almost a fear of changing them um, for, for, for concern that they're, they're going to fall over and cause either embarrassment for them personally or brand damage. And I think that's where, you know, the other, the other point I made earlier is having lots of different solutions monitoring different parts of your estate makes it very hard then to see that bigger picture of well, what, what is going on with the legacy system versus the demand from our web channel. Because the web channel might be you know, driving traffic internally through to the, the legacy system that started to fall over and creak. So how do you get that kind of complete visibility and control over what's going on in your organization? And I guess my argument would be you need to rethink the architecture and you need to kind of simplify the world of, of IT operations and management and security. In the moment, there's just too many different sort of systems that are competing for attention and they don't have the complete picture uh, and they create as many arguments perhaps as they, as they solve individual problems that they're in to solve. So um, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet for the legacy system challenge, but I think uh, not monitoring it effectively and hoping it's just going to continue to sort of operate effectively in a world where you're perhaps pushing more traffic through it or connecting different systems to it is a recipe for, well, it's certainly not a recipe for success. You, you kind of need to get a better handle on what's going on in that world. Um, also from a cost perspective as well. I mean, I, I speak to many organizations that just don't know what infrastructure they still need in, in, the, in their legacy worlds, what software licenses they still need. Now, how do they get visibility of the usage of the, of the software and infrastructure across those environments? Because actually, if they could identify that they could switch off a bunch of, of kit and tin and free up people's time, you know, that are managing those systems, then, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of like, you know, taking the shackles off in many cases, but many are too afraid to do it because they don't have accurate data on what's actually going on in that world. So the legacy world is definitely a really important one. You know, of course, everyone likes to talk about cloud and edge and 5G and all this sort of new exciting stuff, but, but actually if you don't have your foundation for execution in a good place, those things are gonna be really difficult to, to, to implement. Um, I'll move on, Marilyn. Perhaps we can take any more questions on this one in a sec. Yeah, sure. I'm still in the sort of first half of my talk. So here's a kind of anecdote. Also, well, for me, I kind of tweeted this sort of a few months, a couple of months ago, um, and it kind of reinforces what we've just been saying, really, that the clouds show that your tech doesn't need to be in the office, so it doesn't need to be on-prem, and, and the, the pandemic has, has made knowledge workers and their managers realise they don't necessarily need to be there either. And I guess it's a tweet, so it's quite short, but, you know, um, the, the, the points that Kylie was just talk, talking to us about, you know, really this is kind of a wake up call for many organisations that, you know, do they, do they really need to be there? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of just reinforcing the points we were making earlier really. So move, 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 moving on a little bit, um, we did a survey, another survey actually recently about the shift to uh, the distributed workforce and working from home. So there's some interesting stats that I'd try to call out. There's, there's, a, there's a whole website, by the way, with the full um, survey results and, and videos and so on from different um, stakeholders giving insight on this. But for, for this audience, I just thought there were a couple of stats that were quite interesting and, and a little bit telling of what's kind of going on. Um, this first one is really interesting. The 45% cannot track whether their devices are patched. You could, you could say patched, up to date, you know, kind of various different things here, like running on up to date sort of software, have the right licensing, um, you know, have you know, have a good picture of their hardware status, you know, via updates, all that sort of stuff. So, for me, <clears throat> the big one here is many organisations pre-pandemic were still working in a mode where the on-prem was like the centre of the castle. So, there are, if you think about the castle and moat sort of world, where you know, everything kind of relies on most sorry, the, the way most organisations were set up to operate was it relied on the fact that most things were within the castle walls, right? So within the perimeter of the office, within the um, confines of the um, the environment, um, so with, yeah, within the kind of premises of the uh, of the organisation. So effectively on prem, and there were a number of management systems that relied on folks either being on premise or connected via a VPN. And of course, the VPN connections were pretty low and quite manageable at that time. Roll forward to today, where you have perhaps stats like 80 to 90 percent of people on VPN or working remotely, uh, and a small fraction on premise. A number of solutions have just stopped being able to work, have stopped being able to deliver the, um, the, the, the insight into what is the patch status, what is the security status, the vulnerability status of, of, of a device, either because they can't see that machine because it's remote, or also because they just can't handle the, um, the connectivity 
uh, or, or the scale of, of, of the number of the machines sort of outside of the on-premise environment, um, which you know other solutions perhaps can. And I think this is this is creating a massive issue, which the longer the sort of pandemic goes on, if you're in a situation where you can't track or patch you know machines or kind of you know keep keep things up to date, you're just building up this debt, you know, this 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 sort of technical debt, this issue that's that's not going to go anywhere unless it's sort of addressed systemically. And then another one was, and I think this is this this for me reinforces a trend I've I've been seeing around zero trust. So 38% of the respondents plan to implement zero trust to reduce reliance on VPNs in order to reduce risks as as employees return to work on site. So this this world where we're going to be working remotely and working in the office a lot more, you know, frequently, you know, changing between those environments far more, you know, as employees start to go back to work more, and I know some countries have already uh, reopened offices perhaps a bit more than we have in the UK, but I think there's going to be a, a series of waves of people kind of being more in the office or perhaps having a couple of days that they're allocated to go into the office uh, you know, versus work from home. And it's going to create the situation where you can't rely on either the device being at home or the systems being at home or the systems being in the office. You're going to need to have something that allows you to operate you know, regardless. And this move towards zero trust, you know, zero trust is, is well worth kind of reading up if, if, if it's a term that's not familiar because ultimately zero trust implemented the right way you know potentially removes the need for vpn but i guess if we go back to the previous legacy point there are maybe still legacy systems that won't be compatible with a zero trust world so this isn't a magic bullet but i think it's interesting to see that people are recognizing the vpn isn't scalable and it is you know other solutions are going to be needed moving forwards uh in this new distributed workforce world that we're in and so all this kind of points to the gaps that kind of come about, and, I, and I've spoken previously at BCS talks about the gap between the IT operations world and security. And I think it's, for me, I, it's a real frustration of mine that we have you know, the, these sort of silos and these divides between the two teams. I understand why in large organizations, in many cases, you needed to have different teams working on the operations and working on securing um, the platforms. But I think it does create gaps you know, and I see this a lot where, you know, we have gaps in visibility because IT operations have one view of the world, perhaps their CMDB or IT asset management system sees one view of the world and security have another view of the world. And it creates a lot of arguments and it, and it creates a lot of problems. So, you know, very much what um, the company I work for, so what Tanium is all about is trying to help close those gaps, help teams work together more seamlessly. And I think in a world where there is a real gap between knowing what you have and where it is, these problems have only kind of you know, got, got, got worse, really. So uh, I think I've got a couple more slides and then we'll go to Q&A. So to sort of summarize where we are with the sort of gap situation, you know, if you kind of take the kind of visibility, resilience, compliance, and sort of security gaps, the phrase I, I use a lot is you can't manage what you can't measure. And I'm sure this will, you know, this will resonate with folks that are running CMDBs and running IT asset management, software asset management platforms. You need a decent solid baseline of data um, and some of these platforms are great, but if you don't have a real time or near real time view of what you've actually got, there are you know, historical sort of out of date view rather than a, 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 an asset that helps you with the situation as it is now. So, you know, you, you definitely need um, a, a decent operating baseline in order to be resilient as well, in order to kind of, you know, know what, what assets you have, what, where, what software you have, where, what your status is, you know, in order to kind of understand your disaster recovery position, perhaps you need, you know, you kind of need the operating baseline to kind of build your resilience picture. Equally, you can't manage what you can't measure, you can't secure what you can't see. So if you can't see what you have and you can't see its status, then you can't secure it. And accountability requires honest communication and collaboration. This one I think is the most challenging right now because the number of kind of conversations that happened between teams like the operations teams and the security teams, like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really not kind of happy with this. Can we have a chat? You know, those sort of conversations where you relied on that sort of trusted in-person kind of conversation just aren't happening as much as, as they were. And I fear there's quite a few things sort of sort of slipping into the cracks because, you know, in order to be kind of be accountable for, for your environment, you need to be able to have that honest communication uh, and, and without the fear that someone's taking the record button on you as you're telling them something that's perhaps, you know, perhaps a little bit embarrassing for your team or, or your part of the organization. So this one is a, is a real challenge. And I think, you know, in order to kind of overcome some of that, having a single source of the truth that everyone buys into and, and, and believes in, you know, re removes this sort of siloed, almost hoarding of information. This is all, I've, I've got my view of the world, but, and there's some skeletons in that closet. 
but I don't want to get them out. Actually, what's far better in my experience from working with, with customers is get all that out on the table, have a shared view of the world, and, and things become far more easy to manage and far more productive. And so the, the, the theme of the, the conference is, is around the kind of future of digital business and, and, and that sort of side of things. And so I believe this is a foundation really for any digital business is to know where your technology is. You know, technology is no longer this sort of nice to have enabler. It's in many cases now a core part of the business. You need to understand what that is, what its risks are and its weaknesses are. And you need to know now. You don't need to, you don't want to know in a couple of weeks time once you've kind of collected the data. You need to know what, what the situation is right now. You need to have collaboration and share processes and data. You need to better trust and empower your people. We touched earlier on the need for trust generally, but this is really important when it comes to technology and technology management and security and privacy. You need, kind of need to have those foundations in place in order for a digital business to operate. And the reality is every business now, particularly in the current pandemic, is a digital business, whether they like it or not. Um, and as much as perhaps line managers are trying to apply micromanagement styles that perhaps worked in the office that don't work remotely, you know, the reality is you need this sort of trust and you need the, the, the platforms to work. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, I suppose, the, the key kind of part of, of what I wanted to talk about today. I'm conscious of time. Um, I'll skip this one because it's all available on our website if people want to see it. The last one I will just briefly touch on is what, what this is. So from an architecture standpoint, you know, with my architecture background, this is a piece of work I've been working on for the last few months, which is, how does all this knit together? How do all these different sort of platforms that, that companies are using, like the architecture platforms, the DevOps platforms, the IT operations platforms, GRC, risk and audit type platforms, and the security platform, how do, how do all those things kind of get fed with data? How do they work effectively together? You know, and how do you get a view of everything in your environment at the bottom across everything from the cloud to you know, edge and internet of things through to what, what things are running on premise, what, what things are running on people's end computers, uh, and the world of operational technology and you know sort of factory type production line kit and retail kit um you know industrial sort of technology and of course all the the, the devices that people are carrying around be them sort of tablet machines or, or mobile devices so how do you kind of bring this really complex kind of world of uh, of technology and assets and and feed all that into the whether it's the it operations platform that's considering the the service management piece the asset management piece or the software piece or, or equally the security piece so this is something i'm for those who are on the are on this who want to talk more about this, I'm happy to, to talk more um, offline. And then just lastly, and I am running out of time, so lastly, this sort of conversation that I'm, I'm having now is very much the conversation we have as part of Architect Tomorrow, which is the community I've been building this year. And we cover, you know, it's not just for architects, it's for folks that are interested in architecture as well and folks that work with architects. And we bring together you know, different perspectives on, on challenges like this. Um, as, as well as also some of the sustainable development goals as well. How do we start to weave in you know, sustainable thinking into our organizations through architecture? And we, yeah, we've run a number of talks and, and, uh, and videos and so on. So um, it's well worth yeah, checking. If you, if, you, if you like this sort of content, then there's some great content on our YouTube channel and our LinkedIn group. And um, we'll, we'll continue to work with BCS. Um, so I'm sure you'll see us again on, on, on BCS uh, events in the future. Okay, shall I go back to either this one or the architecture one Marilyn for questions or have we got questions on another part of the content I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go through everything that we've got sort of remaining yep. in the question now and yep. the comment and okay. and from your earlier part of the presentation we had Bavin commenting saying that they've been finding the availability of people for quick meetings has increased um, maybe because people are able to connect from anywhere and it may not it may be adding to productivity and agility so that's just their observation okay yep um yeah, and I mean, one of the questions sorry i was gonna say one of the questions from david here is um is there a place for workplace mentors who are tasked at helping distributed workers be more effective and co-workers who are spaced um you know in different locations it's interesting, isn't it? It's almost like the agile coach um, type um, approach, which I think for many organizations has worked really well. Yeah, I, I think if you're quite a traditional business that um, isn't used to working this way, uh, then that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think software companies, I would hope in many cases have some of this already in their DNA, but I think it depends on what industry sector you're in. Absolutely, perhaps getting an advisor or getting a coach from another industry sector that has sort of better um a better grasp of distributed working that definitely would, would make sense i think so yeah yes i think is the answer to that one 
Yeah, and then and, and a couple more from David actually. Um, yep. David says, um, are tribes agile? Many tribes seem to be risk averse and <laughs> very productive to to ways of um, doing things. Pro yeah, sorry, pro yeah. protective. Yep. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good observation. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, how perhaps some of the uh, agile software movement has tried to latch on some of these terms and not thought about that. Um, I, I, I think about this one in terms of specialization. And I think you know, the whole tribes thing is how do you allow a group of specialists to really focus in and zone in on what they're really good at and how do they kind of work effectively and efficiently and delegate down to them perhaps some of the thinking around risk and thinking around um, what 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 trade-offs need to be made at that level rather than someone at a really senior level who doesn't really understand what's going on on the ground kind of making all those sorts of decisions but I think you're right I think there is a danger perhaps of resistance to change uh, it depends on the culture of that, within that tribe I think you need a good mix of people you need a diverse mix of people within those tribes so that they don't become like groupthink you, you need you know you need dissenting voices you need to be able to have open and honest communication that I was talking touching on earlier you need to be able to call out where there are problems and be able to face into that and not, yeah, not sort of just stick your head in the sand and go, no, we're all fine here. Our tribe is all hunky-dory. We don't need to change. So, um, yeah, really, really good point, actually, that there is a danger that perhaps tribes just stick to what they think works rather than perhaps experimenting and trying and trying new things. The other thing I would say on this, though, is the tribe, if you get it right, is at the right size that if they do experiment or they do make some changes, it's not, you know, it shouldn't in many cases obviously depending on what the tribe is doing it should have a fairly limited blast radius and by that i mean if they experiment on something on a new process or a new way of working it shouldn't it shouldn't impact the wider organization it should perhaps only impact a smaller part of the of the organization and i think this is the the big sort of plus of a lot of the move towards devops uh, and smaller incremental changes is the, the risks of making changes is reduced um, clearly that's hard where you have a large legacy system you can't slice up into smaller pieces um but you know the, the the concept is there the theory is there that you um you know, can de-risk uh the, the wider organization by breaking down that sort of decision making and, and change at a more granular level but i in all honesty i haven't seen many large organizations get this right yet i think software companies you know the likes of spotify and netflix and so on clearly they're doing it but i and, and perhaps telecoms companies and so on are but i think the other more traditional industries haven't quite got there yet yeah, I think you're also right on the um, a lot of the places where I've worked as well, where there have been people that have been risk averse or averse to change or, you know, wanting to keep things the way that they are. I think maybe some of that will also stick around because so much is volatile now, really. Mm -hmm. yep. There's so much change. So you want to keep something stable in your life that's not, you know, uh, continuously yeah, disrupted. Really point, in, in times of uncertainty, you want to hang on to something that you, you know and understand. Yeah, no, that, that that's... That's fair, and I suppose comes back to that that um, piece we were talking about earlier around perhaps coaching people to kind of, um, yeah, not not get too st stuck on 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 their current sort of operating model. But yeah, no, it's 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 going to be interesting to see how teams and organisations sort of change or don't uh, over the next few months. Yeah, and and next comment here from David is surely the biggest productivity killer is rework, doing something wrong um or, or which only works for a few people and then doing it again and again and again that was to your uh a previous slide about the operational changes the costs and yeah, uh, no. kylie asks sorry go on, go on. kylie asks how do we incentivize investment in modernizing the existing legacy systems yeah no it, it, i i i think this one really boils down to communicating effectively what that legacy system does for your organization and tying the fact that it may be a blocker or a barrier to being able to open up new channels of business. Uh, and so I think the the investment is off. The question is often, do you continue to support it? Do you, um, you know, continue to kind of uh, operate it or do you start to look at how you move away from it or how you but either how you start to move away from it or how you start to displace it in sort of phases. Um, I worked at a, 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 a banking organization that I touched on earlier. And there was a, a move away from the big mainframe platform for, for core banking. And there was a you know very um, ambitious plan to do that, to move it to a more modern platform. 
uh, and actually the, the project was only partially successful it only got to certain types of bank accounts it didn't it didn't really succeed because the challenges are so great and I think it's it's a difficult one because many careers have sort of been ended on on many a legacy transformation project so it's a tricky one um I don't have any sort of silver bullet answer for this one but I, but I think communicating the communicating what those systems do and potentially what they stop the organization from being able to do in the future is really important so whenever anyone says oh we want to do this kind of big exciting you know online initiative or we want to you know open up a partner channel or we want to do an api i think it's it's on every architect or operations or you know asset management type person to go well, hang on a minute you need to realize what the relationship is between that initiative and our underlying infrastructure you know, you can't just constantly kind of put these shiny things on top of a foundation that's that's crumbling. Um, I, I like using the house analogy, actually. It's worked many times to kind of talk about the house and the different sort of parts of the house. And, you know, as much as people perhaps like to sort of think about the shiny exterior or the, or the nice fancy kitchen in the house, if your foundations are crumbling or you've got subsidence because you've not invested in, in, in you know, those foundations of legacy underpinnings, you're going to run into problems. Uh, and again, Comes back to having that really good picture of your assets what their status is how up to date they are and i would say legacy systems aren't just those big mainframes anymore they are all those windows server operating systems that have gone out of support that many organizations are still running but microsoft no longer support so you know the, the definition of legacy is now shifting and i and i talked recently actually about um you know today's exciting new flashy technology is tomorrow's legacy and how do you sort of manage that cycle that life cycle of, of technology is really important yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and coming back to the issue around security and patching of remote working, mm. um, Jason asks, would it be prudent to spend money on a laptop per person rather than relying on having secure devices at home, spending the money on the devices rather than beefing up security systems in this in the case of insecure home devices? Yeah, I, I personally think if you're in a in an industry that's even slightly regulated, having purchased laptops for your staff makes a lot of sense. I think trying to secure the bring your own device type approach is always going to be really, really difficult because it, there's just too many gray areas in ownership and policy for a personally owned device. How can you really know it's secure? You know, how do you know it's posture, device posture is? So no, I would agree. I think that but I think the two go hand in hand. I think you need, you need um, uh, corporately owned equipment, but then you need software that's helping you get on, uh, get a visibility of what that machine is, you know, its, its status is. And, and not only its status, but then being able to take action when it's out of date, but being able to take action regardless of whatever that device is, that's really important. And so many companies I, I've spoken to recently are very much reliant on a process that only works when folks are mostly in the office, which is causing them major headaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've uh, worked to be on BYO devices in the past too with containerized apps, and I thought that was the most secure way to work, really. Comes up to the zero trust piece. I mean, yeah, if you can get that to work, great. But how many of those applications can truly be containerized like that? If they're sort of modern web applications, you know, or perhaps fairly recent applications, fine. But there will still be a whole load of applications that, you know, unfortunately aren't in a situation where you can neatly containerize them like that. But yeah, in theory, if you can, if you can completely isolate um, that application from the from from the device through a zero trust type approach, great. But in many cases, that's just a, a holy grail that many organisations haven't managed to achieve yet. Yeah. Um, one more from David here saying um, the counter position is to, you know, you can't, you can manage, sorry, you can't manage what you can't measure is that you get what you measure and you, and what you measure is easy to measure, not what <laughs> you need. To measure. Okay, I, love, I love this one because there are yeah, yeah there, are, there are obviously lots of metrics and people sort of feeling like they know the situation in their environment because they've got a they've got a stat and the reality is the stat is based on what's easy to measure i think what, one of the things that we really help folks with is getting a, a real picture not what microsoft's telling you or, or what you know amazon or whatever is telling you actually a rea real picture like now or as of the last few seconds of what's actually going on so I, david i'd love to have a conversation with you about you know, I, I don't want to do a big pitch here because that's not what this presentation is about, but very happy to take offline, David, how, how we help customers with meaningful stats and metrics and not those that are just conveniently telling the story that you want to report upwards. Because I see that so much sort of stats that are almost protecting someone's current position or team, which then get blown apart when you get real data. 
um, from from that environment. Yeah, and we talked about that yesterday with Jonathan when he talked about full stack outsourcing and you know how the SLAs can be all rolled up to green, yet there can be a inherent problem that's um it, it's still green, but it's actually causing a, a poor customer experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think having that visibility of what your outsource partners are doing on your behalf, what the health and status is of what's going on is really important because you're right, it could you could have green on sort of service availability, but the reality is they're not keeping everything up to date when patched, therefore they're leaving you with a massive security risk um, because perhaps they're cost optimizing the outsourced agreement but as part of that they are not kind of keeping that environment healthy you know not keeping the hygiene the security hygiene sort of up, up to date so yeah I know it's, it's a really interesting one and the, the power of kind of um, transparent data transparency through data to kind of drive accountability is is is, is a really interesting uh, point but we probably run out of time to explore that one in depth yeah, great comment here from Kylie saying she sees her life as a three-legged stool, work, home and family are the three legs. Um, I can cope with one of them being wobbly, but two or more are wobbly, then I start to really struggle. I really like that. Yeah, that's really good. So I might have to steal I. that one, Kylie. <laughs> um, a couple more from David here. Software companies are very good. Um, sorry, are a very special case. Most companies are not software companies despite having everything software mantra these mm. days and then yeah, surely I, sorry no go. i was going to say and then surely he says only modernize legacy if there is a good business case and sometimes the legacy is working good enough you know or better than good enough yeah it comes back to that conversation we were having earlier about kind of being risk averse and change averse isn't it i mean um, it may be working good enough now, or it may have been working good enough for a year ago when everyone was in the office, but is it working good enough now? And will it work good enough when there's another pivot that your business needs to make? So I think uh, it's, it, yeah, the business case needs to be looked at really carefully, because in some cases, if it's doing a good enough job and you can layer things on top of it through perhaps APIs and through integration, great. You know, if your architecture allows for that thing just to sit there and hum along, fine. But um, it depends, you know, how prepared I think and resilient you want to be to change moving forwards. But but yeah, the business case need, needs to be looked at, you know, with a sane uh, standpoint, not just a, oh, we want to kind of make it all sexy and exciting and invest in the latest technology. So it's I, I get I, I get where you're coming from on that one, uh, David. But yeah, I think I think it's important not to be too blinkered to what might be around the corner. Yeah, and uh, last comment we've got here from David also is often SLAs are used to blame um, avoidance and all of the metrics being green and thus the UX is awful. Yeah, no, I I, I, uh, I very much agree with that. I think um, management by SLA, you, know, you optimise for SLA rather than for experience as we kind of touched on already. So yeah, having something that can kind of really drill down into what's really going on beyond that sort of high level SLA, yeah, really important. Yeah, we talked about that um, myself and uh, Jonathan uh, offline actually about, you know, it comes down to relationship, making sure you can dig right down into those with your partner, you know, that if you haven't built that relationship, then you're not going to get the truth out of them and you're not going to get them to support you. Yeah, the trust, um, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. trust, <laughs> trust, trust, trust. That's come through from Duncan's right way through this. Trust your employees, <laughs> trust your outsourcer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, some fabulous conversation generated there and we've um, got to the end of our questions and comments today, which is great. We're probably this is one of the sessions we've ne nearly managed to keep to the time, which is brilliant. So <laughs> thank good. you so much for this wonderful presentation today, Oliver. No worries. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Thank you. And uh, hopefully you do make it this evening, but if you don't, that's cool. We'll, um, yeah, we've got no, your takeaway slide. Yeah, I may have to join by the by phone. I'll I'll, I'll let you know if, if I can be there. Yeah, I will. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll Thanks. we've got your takeaway slide anyway, Sam. We've had a really good presentation discussion here, which we'll be able to share with the audience that joins this evening anyway, and um and help answer any questions in relation to that. So, um. That is our next session for this evening, folks, um, where we bring together the whole themes that, and the threads that we've had from all of our presenters throughout this conference across, you know, so software asset management, licensing, service management, enterprise architecture, enterprise service management, all of these topics. Um, so hopefully you can come back and join us this evening.
um, for that session. So do make sure you're registered and you can you can be there at half past six to have our recap with um, Richard, the chair, and also then have more of your questions answered by the panel and let's start looking at how we can pull all this together, how we can keep the benefits and how can we be the drivers of those changes that we want to keep as a workforce and ensure that we don't fall back into the old ways that don't serve us. Definitely. Lovely. Thanks. Great, thanks very much thanks, for today, Oliver. Thank you. And thanks all for your questions and thanks for joining us. So we'll see you this evening at half past. <laughs>